Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another What Would You Change podcast. We are the Super Monkey Fighters. I am Loki, here with Monkey Feathers and Papa Nugget. How are you guys doing? Hello. Great. Good to hear. Uh, This week, uh, we are going through the movie Big Fish. Uh, It's a 2003 film directed by Tim Burton, written by Daniel Wallace and John August. It stars Ewan McGregor. Albert Finney, Billy Crudup, Jessica Lange, Helena Bottom Carter, of course, uh, Allison Lohman, Robert Gulami? Sure, let's go with that one. Uh, Marion Cotillard shows up in this, Uh, Matthew McGorry, David Denham, uh, Denham, Missy Pyle, Uh, Steve Buscemi shows up in this, Uh, Ada Tai and Arlene Tai, Uh, let's see, Danny DeVito's in this, of course, and Deep Roy as Mr. Soggy Bottom. If you don't know what this movie is, it's the story of a father and a son, uh, and the dad always tells big, boisterous stories, like big fish stories that always are wild and crazy and are not quite the truth. They're grounded in reality, but they're they're fantasy and they're fairy tales. Um, And it's his son trying to figure out what actually happened. But even then, it's really more just the stories. Like, it's less about him, like his journey to find find out the truth, and it's more just these are the stories of this man's life. The man being, of course, Edward Bloom, played by Ewan McGregor and Albert Finney. Uh, they play younger and older versions of the same character. So, which also his uh, wife Sandra is played by Jessica Lange and uh, Allison Lohman. So, what do you guys think? What was your favorite stuff? I like the way that they they told the stories um, and kind of walked us through it. Um, just visually. And to me, it almost seemed like they did a really good job of telling the story visually in a way that seemed like it was a story being told to a child. Almost. It was very, and it almost feels like it should be uh, a negative and it would be a negative in, in some films, but for this one, it works it, because the storytelling feels very disconnected. From what's going on. It's definitely, you know, when a story is being told and when you're back in reality. So, so I think they did a good job with, with um, kind of portraying the stories and and telling them, I mean, considering it's a Tim Burton film, um, you you could see kind of the Tim Burton kind of styles in there, um, but they definitely weren't as in your face as some videos. Yeah. That that's one of the things I like about this as much as is it doesn't feel like a Tim Burton movie until you're watching it and you're like, wow, this is very much a Tim Burton feel- movie, but doesn't still doesn't look like it. It's it's too bright and cheery and Yeah. But it still but, has that whimsical Yeah. yeah. And it, like all the machinery is still Tim Burton, all the characters are still Tim Burton and yeah. Well one scene that really stood out was Edward Bloom is town hero and he's doing the power pose in front of the the lawn mowing. That yeah, that's exactly me. what I was thinking uh-huh. of. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it and then very... just, just before that, when he's, he said he had to be in bed for three years cause he, his, his, his body grew too fast or something like that. Yeah. And he's in this contraption. That's very much a yeah. Tim Burton contraption of. And yeah. then the house that was leaning um, yeah. and kind of all of that, that felt very yeah. Tim Burton-y. It, as well, or it's, even the white picket fence where mm-hmm. I saw it and it reminded me of the house from Beetlejuice. Even the the real house that they're living in, in not in story worlds, feels like the realistic version of the Beetlejuice house. Like it, it it's that you know it, it has that look and feel, and it's it's very vertical and, and has layer. Yeah, it's 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 all it's like Tim Burton restrained in the real world a little bit. Yeah, but I I think those aesthetics play well into the the storytelling concept, right? They fit very, very well into this, this story and the plot of of the film. I think in telling the stories, the characters work well. Uh, They're not characters that there is much depth around, um, but they're very kind of. They're form fitted to their roles. I guess mm-hmm. um, a very yeah. kind of they're they're over the top um, to to stand out, which which yeah. plays into that kind of fantastical storytelling, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think the way that the characters were portrayed within the stories work well. The same way that the 
the scenery and the the sets all are as well. They're they're very kind of stylized and cliche in some ways. But I think there's there's enough personality within each of them that they're interesting in the the short amount of time that we see them throughout the story. Well, and they they they, they stand out because they are the characters in his life. Like if, if you look at yeah. your life as a story, like everybody else falls into the background because they're not necessarily important. Mm -hmm. The people who stand out are the ones who, you know, the friends and family and, and those kinds of things. Um, because some of these people he's known since he was uh, a kid, which if I remember right, the doctor um, is in one of the stories as one of his friends um, when they're young kids, when they're going to see the witch. Yep. So he's known him since he was, you know, in grade school and then the giant he met when he was 18 and you know the people from the town of specter were all he met all those people when he was a young man and they're you know at the end of his life they're all coming back to mm -hmm. see him and that they've all been important figures in his life whether or not they've been there all the time they stand out in the story because they were important so and that's, at the time of the story yeah, yeah and that's mm -hmm. and that's the kind of i think the the message that the father is trying to get across is you know, these are the important people. That's why I tell the stories about them. And so, um, which is why his biggest story, the big fish story is about his son, because that's the big story that he tells everybody. And that's the thing that his son misses is because it's not a true story. It's an outright fabrication. That's the one story that he tells that has n not anything really based in reality. Um, cause he tells a story about catching the fish with the, with the wedding ring on the day that his son was born. Mm -hmm. And that's why he missed the, the birth when the reality is, is that he was just out of town on business and couldn't make it back. And, you know, and it's just a boring early, story, but yeah. it's, it's completely, it's completely different in, in, in all of that. But the point of it is, is every person he has ever met, he has told this story to because his son is the most important person in his life. And so it's the story of his wife and his son and, the, and his birth. And it's, that's, that's the important thing, not the facts of the story because nobody would remember the facts of the story. Right. So, and that's, uh, you know, I, that's kind of the point I think that he's trying to get across. And it's the point that I think is missed. It's that he's misunderstood by being him and it's, it's a struggle for everybody else. I think there's a few people who really understand that nature of him and accept that, but I think there's other people who accept it, but wish it was different. And then there's his son who just can't accept like he wants to know the truth and that's why those two are at odds. And I think they both want to not be at odds, but they both don't know how to see things from the other person's perspective. And so they're both just consistently trying and just kind of consistently failing until, you know, the end. So I actually, I do agree with the, the like for this, which is I liked how they did tell the stories and I liked that it was broken up between what was going on in the real world. And basically this guy is, he's dying of cancer, but he still wants to tell stories. And it's like the grandfather at the table who's telling the same stories over and over. You know you've heard the stories. You're tired of hearing the stories, but he still wants to keep telling the same stories. And the way that the storytelling usually get started is how the older version is remember i remember when i saw this iceberg and he goes into telling like an iceberg and the son of course dismisses it yeah. but it's usually the older version starts telling the story that leads into the visual representation of it on screen and this movie is very heavily reliant upon narration because it is a storytelling movie instead and it's of just got four or five different narrators throughout. And, yeah, yeah, four or five, but they're all telling a story. And so mm -hmm. I think it makes sense for there to be narration. And there are things that, the specific scenes that I, I, I like, especially with the son when his dad is actually like he had the stroke and he's on his deathbed, where his dad asks, well, how, how do I go? And then his son tells his own elaborate big fish story of 
how it all went. And I, I really liked that scene because it just is, it's his son, you know, kind of accepting a little bit of who his dad was, which was a storyteller. And he's then telling his own story of how he goes. And then his dad finally dies. And it was, it was a really touching moment. I kind of, I really liked it. So. Yeah. It's a really good kind of culmination to the, the sons uh, played by Billy Crudup, um, his, his journey throughout where he starts out the film as an adult hating his dad's lies. He feels like his dad's lied to him his whole life and that nothing's ever been true. And they've all just been these fantasy fantasy stories, but he's kind of seen some truth in a few of them. And he's kind of found the kind of the good natured quality of his dad by that point in time. And so he kind of comes to accept his dad's way of doing things. And of course it's at the funeral where everything is really more solidified as to what was actual reality in that he was telling stories about his life that he was just embellishing the details to make it more fantastical and more interesting. So people would pay attention. So, which is what his dad had been saying to him his whole life. And so, and that, that funeral scene is another one that I liked because it was a celebration of who his dad was and these stories being told through all these characters that he met throughout his time being alive. Well, and it mirrors the story that he told his dad on his deathbed, only the reality of it, where everybody's there and everybody's happy. And and so it, it's that. It's just not the fantastical version where they're racing through town. Yeah. And, you know, people are transporting through space and time and those kinds of things. So I say that, that's the thing that I that stood out to me this time watching through. Of course, I've seen it before. But it was... It was a much more realistic dysfunctional family situation where father and son haven't spoken in years, you know, they're adults and they haven't spoken in years because of a big blow up, at, you know, at an event kind of a thing. And it wasn't just like that. They hadn't, they just, it wasn't a fight. It wasn't a big dramatic scene. It just, they just didn't talk. And, um, there's a couple of scenes where they try to talk that were very, they just felt very real to me from, I guess, maybe personal experience a little bit. Um, it's specifically the iceberg, iceberg scene where you, you brought that up, where uh, the son asked the dad, have you ever seen an iceberg? And his dad launches into a story and he's like, well, no, it's, I'm using a metaphor, dad. And he's like, well, then you need to say the thing about icebergs is. But the way that his dad starts every conversation is, did I ever tell you the story about, you know, he asks, he starts every story with a question. And so, um that was just a very, it felt very realistic in how that communication just breaks down and how one side can be frustrated, the other side cannot see it, and then that frustration just ekes into that conversation. And, you know, it's, like I said, that, that to me felt very real, just kind of that. It wasn't over-the-top dramatic the way that movies tend to portray things, or right? they push things to the extremes on those. This just felt very realistic which I guess could be a turn away for some people because you're like, well, I have my own struggles in life. I don't need to I have watch my own realistic drama. Why struggles. Why do I need like, your drama? I, I want, you know, I want the big things. I want the people, you know, those kinds of things. But I just, yeah, that, I, that stood out to me a lot more this time. The other thing that I absolutely loved, characters. That's my favorite scene in this film is with uh, Mr. Soggy Bottom at the circus. Uh little bit of context he ends up working at a circus after he leaves his hometown as a kid so he's trying to find information about the woman of his dreams uh the circus is run by danny devito um and deep roy plays mr soggy bottom kind of the head clown and it turns out that uh danny devito is a werewolf <laughs> and um as edward bloom discovers this everybody starts running and screaming and he's, he's kind of fighting with this wolf and deep Roy dressed in full clown gear and a big suit just opens up this little door <laughs> as this gun and a silver <laughs> bullet and then loads it up and goes to shoot. And he has a single tear running down his face in full, you know, grease paint. And uh, to me, that is just, a, it's a perfectly uh, adequate and hilarious scene. Just all of that is, um, I just that it's just one of those scenes that stands out and just, you know, it, it invokes many happy. different and emotions at the same many time, different emotions. <laughs> and it's just it's very enjoyable in 
Yeah, I just I, that stands out to me is fantastic. Um, and then it's, of course, followed up by a very, I think, a very Danny DeVito scene um, when he wakes up in the morning uh, and he's scratching his ear with his foot. <laughs> um, that just fits like a, that's like a that's less of a Tim Burton move and more of a Danny DeVito move. So but that's just I mean, that's just one of a thousand examples of this movie that have just those kind of memorable moments. I mean, when he first sees his wife and time stands still and he's walking through and everything's frozen to the giant, you know, being an actual giant, but really he's, you know, he, he is a very tall man, but in the stories he's 15 feet tall where he's really probably like, you know, nine. And I just, I, I think that that's, I, again, that felt very real to me because I can identify the people in my lives who fit a lot of these characters. I don't personally identify with any of these characters, but I, I, I know people like most of them. More the realistic characters, like the father and son, and the mother and the, you know, I, I, I just I, I, I identify third party with some of those people. So, I mean, overall, um, a positive experience. This is a film that I do recommend. It's not one that I like. Was it good? Was it bad? And I'm saying yes or no as a, a review. Like I actively tell people that, yeah, you know, I think you should check this one out. I didn't really enjoy it all that much. I can see why, like this time around, like less of it stood out. Like I knew what was coming. And so I didn't, you know, the whimsy kind of faded a little bit. I do recommend it when I say, and I do talk about how I do enjoy the film when I recommend it. It's not, a perfect movie by any stretch of the means. Like I can easily see people just being bored by this um, or, or fitting more into the camp of the son who wants to know more of the real stories. Like as soon as you accept that it's a, uh, <laughs> as soon as you accept that these are fake stories, like you can kind of start picking out that, okay, this is the event. Like he runs into an old friend that he knew in a bank he he knew this person for, for years. He runs into him in a bank and they end up robbing the bank. And then he helps him turn his life around and he becomes a Wall Street millionaire. Um, the reality of that story is probably that he ran into a guy in the bank who didn't know what to do with his life. And he just said, yeah, well, you know, here's some things. Maybe you should go and do this. He like, it, it, It's not a big, massive bank robbery <laughs> kind of a situation, right? It's just a, a tiny event. He ran into a person who was important to him and then that was that. And then it's important to the overall story later on because he does help finance some things later on. So yeah, once you get past that, I can see those just being boring and like, okay, let's just move through this. I just, I, you know, the more interesting stories would be the son discovering the reality behind it. So you, you hear the story that he's heard a million times. And instead of just being told that story, you see him uncover the truth behind it and more in depth than just, Oh, these people really did exist. <laughs> oh, what do you mean? Dad really did disappear in the war? Because that would, I think, would showcase the journey of the son a little bit more. Um, because that iceberg scene we discussed earlier, his dad says, I've only ever been me since the day I was born. Um, and if that's a problem, that's that's your problem, not mine, kind of a thing. And I think that's the that's what the movie should be about. Like It's about the characters, but the journey is his son realizing that his dad has been telling him these stories. And so the details are there. It's just difficult to tell what the details are because there's also embellishments. And so, you know, he disappeared in the war. Yeah. He went missing for four months and everybody thought he was dead. And then he showed back up. Like what's the reality, but that's the thing. What's the reality of that? Cause it obviously wasn't, he met Siamese twins yeah. in a Chinese, but he did oh, meet twins, though. He did so meet twins, it, and it does make you yeah. wonder what the real story is. Yeah, because there is, but that's the problem. Yeah, and that's the problem is that you don't go into those real stories. So, I think the the, the story that the movie should have told should have gone more in depth into the funeral scene where he is learning the realities of what happened with that because. He, he, the doctor finally tells him the real story of his birth and he's just like, it was boring. There, It's nothing exceptional about it. And he's like, and if I'd get to choose, I might choose differently, but that's just me. And that, that's that. And I think yeah. that's more. I think I agree more with the son's perspective of, you know what? I kind of like your story better. Yeah. I think I fall, maybe, maybe Nugget will agree with this, but I fall into the category of, I want the truth behind a story 
And once I know the truth, then you can embellish the story and make it more fantastical. But behind all of it, it's I would still want the truth behind a story instead of spending my whole life trying to figure out if a story is true or not. Because when you embellish it so much, you're left wondering, do I even know who you are? Kind of where the sun is. Yeah. Well, and especially and so. with these stories, that's the embellishments are so big that the facts are completely washed away because nothing about the story is believable. So why would you believe that he disappeared during the war? Yeah. Yeah. You can only yeah. imagine how much cognitive dissident dissonance is going on in the son's head. If he's hearing these stories in his entire life and he's like, what? Like, like, yeah. yeah. And that's the thing. Like, and they, they show how their relationship basically is more or less falls apart because yeah because they're they they don't understand each other and like I I would I would feel the same way the son would like yeah because because regardless of telling embellishing stories like if you can't have honest conversations and be able yep. to get down to the truth with people. Like I wouldn't trust I wouldn't trust the father with anything. I'd yeah. be like, this guy's full of shit. Like he just well, makes up stories. He's just a con artist. He's just trying uh -huh. to get one over on everyone. Like I wouldn't trust I wouldn't trust him with anything. Like uh -huh. so like I completely side with the son. Like I think he's fully well, justified and I would do the same thing. It, it it's part of the things that I recognize in that realism there that even though his son came to some positive conclusion before his dad died, it was still very much one sided. Like he accepted his father. And I, I, yeah. I think that's realistic. I don't think he, I don't think he, the son got closure on anything. No, I think he'll be able to, because he'll be able to dig through records and actually go and talk to people who will tell him the real stories. Um, but I think that's, that's the realism is that life doesn't end up being perfect. And I think that's, it's the point of the movie that's missed a lot. And that's, that's not, it's not as obvious in that. Um, that's the way the father sees the things. Like um, I look at the whole specter storyline when he goes into specter, this, the town of specter, there is something there. Like, and that's why I, as a film, I want the I want to know these things because these would be a bit more interesting. But they would be those big, over the, overly dramatic, painful moments. Like something happened where he died or almost died. It was a very big traumatic event, and it was probably something like he got mugged or something like that. But you know, the town of Spectre is kind of an allegory for the afterlife, and like, oh, you're here, but you're early. We're not expecting you yet. Those kinds of things, and yeah. then. Except but it also kind of changes later on because it's, yeah. That's so the confusing part is because in the beginning, in the yeah. beginning, it kind of alludes to, well, this is the afterlife and you're early. Mm -hmm. But then he returns. Mm -hmm. So did he. Well, he returns, but then he buys Spectre and then yep. he's renovating and, it. And so fixes it and changes everything. And so um, that's the confusing part is because yeah. you're alluded to the fact that it's the afterlife. But then later in the film, it kind of changes to not be the afterlife yeah. so it that wasn't consistent it's in thinking through the stories as metaphors that's a story where you never really find out what the reality or even the, the bits of the reality were because it is a metaphor because they literally like oh we were leaving town me and my new friend the giant the town we grew up in and there were two paths that diverged and one of them was the the easy path that everybody took because it made sense it was a paved road and the other one was the old path that had warning signs and don't go do those kinds of things. So, you know, as a metaphor, that's more of probably he took the bad path in life and he was, you know, doing drugs and those kinds of, I don't know what it would have been in his life. And that's, that's what I want to know is, is, okay, what happened in those? And what, you know, you obviously learned lessons and moved on in life. And that's the important thing, especially to teach to kids um, as a parent is there's a reason why there's warning signs in front of the bad road. Like the metaphor is that it's like, oh, there's snakes and spiders and all those kinds of things. And you'll likely die. And it's like, but that's if you a metaphor for his life. But if you only teach your children or tell your children an embellished positive spin on yes. the bad things in your life, like what are you yeah. teaching them? Nothing. What are you teaching them? And that's, and that's what I, you know, 
a lot of these stories were the stories that he told his young son and he didn't evolve the stories into the to reality as his son got older. And that's, that's the important thing is, is that the reason that fairy tales are told to kids is because it's an easier way to digest information sure. for them. And so that's, that's the thing is this is the story of an imperfect man being told as if he's perfect. Like, Every story he tells is I'm, I'm fantastic and I'm great. And even when it's the stories of I took the bad road and things were terrible and I almost died and lost my shoes, it's told in a way that makes him seem fantastic and amazing and that he was great throughout. Mm -hmm. And so that's why one of the kind of the points that's it's not shoved in your face, but you know, where his son feels like I guess it is in one scene, his son feels like his dad had another family because he traveled a lot. And then he kind of meets that other family and realizes that that's not the case, that, you know, this other person felt that way about his actual family. And that that's, but that's again, the story that's told it's Helena bottom, Helena bottom Carter tells that story. Um, and, but she's telling the story only it's told the same way that Albert Finney's or uh, Edward would tell the story, right? It's, it's not, her version of events it's his, his version of events <laughs> and so it's um again it makes him out to be just kind of this perfect guy who even though he has some struggles he's still this shining beacon throughout all of it regardless of how fantastical the stories are like yeah. they're they're good i mean they were they were yeah. told, told well but mm -hmm. like him as a character in which i get back to you i'm fine with the characters in the story yeah. being kind of shallow that's that's fine. That's how they should be. But they never get into the depth of the father and son mm -hmm. about the stories. And that's yeah. what really yeah, makes it all boring. And yeah, and that, that's a major negative. And I think that's part of why I, I recommend it is because it ends up being less of a thinker movie for me and more of a just, I'm going to, it's just there. Like I did find myself occasionally pulling out my phone and, you know, playing an, an, a game or something like that. Like I wasn't focused on the movie as much as I should have been. It's hard um, to get invested because, into some bullshit. Yeah. And that's pretty much what it is, is it's, it's because there wasn't, it never came back around to the realities of the stories because they're like, Oh, well the stories are just boring. And it's like, well, nah, I mean, here's the thing the people who are important into your life, you want to know what those stories are. Anyway, feathers, you've been kind of quiet on your negatives. Well, cause I have a couple. So looking at it from a technical standpoint, I really didn't like how they did the scene with Edward and the giant. I, it just, it was having seen Lord of the Rings and how they did the perspective the forced, between yeah, the between people who are, whether they're normal size or not, and then, you know, smaller people, I noticed it yeah. a lot more in this film. I just, I really didn't like those scenes because of it. Because all I'm noticing is, I can't say necessarily CGI, because I don't know how they did it, if it was a forest perspective or not. But those scenes just were really... I would say bad it's, in how yeah. they how they were shot. So yeah. that that's kind of one of the main ones that I noticed first off. But another thing that I didn't like was the ringleader, how he's exploiting all of his workers <laughs> as well as what? Edward, yeah. where instead of paying him actual money, uh -huh. I'll pay you with one one fact about this woman who you have fallen in love with <laughs> and for three years Fact: she likes music whoa she goes to college mind blowing she, she drinks likes, water <laughs> yes so it's yeah. it, it's a ringleader who exploits his workers uh -huh. yeah and i didn't i didn't appreciate that given how I know that it's sometimes, whether it's a myth or it's actual fact in history, but you do sometimes hear the stories about circus owners who do have I, poor... Yeah, there's, there's a reason why they traveled. It's so they could get away with stuff. But do we know town. if that was true or was that just well, part we, of the story? We, 
We don't. And but because it's, it's, it's told again, as a story know. perspective, you're just kind of led to believe that there is some fact to it. Yeah. If he was taking advantage of this giant, why did they show up to their friend's funeral yeah. 50 years later? And they were all good friends. And they were all in the family. Yeah, you know. And so that's, yeah. yeah, those are some of those inconsistencies that you're like, okay, that's, yeah. Did, did he remedy that at some point in their life? Like, there's something more interesting going on there than just, oh, he was a giant in a circus. Because that's all it was. And at that point in time, it stops being a story about the giant in the circus. Because you'll notice that the giant in the circus is never around during mm-hmm. his entire story of trying to find out about his wife. Like, he works at the circus for three years and doesn't interact with his friend he brought to the circus like it's in any of those stories and all those stories are just like he was shoveling elephant crap and And he never out of a cannon and those kinds of things like yeah and he almost never interacts with his wife the person that he loves so much in any of the stories (laughs) it's all about what he does when he's not with his wife yeah and you know his son points that out to to his wife who's pregnant she, he just says flat out, like, my dad was never around. And so I I can't. I, I have all of these weird thoughts and feelings because my dad was just not there. He was a traveling salesman. And so he was gone more than he was around. And so the only thing that we ever got was these stories. And I don't know what I don't know my dad. I don't know him as a person. And so. Well, and that's the uncomfortable part about it is when you're given such elaborate stories of this man's life you are kind of left wondering as the son is is my dad having an affair because he refuses to tell the truth he's just telling stories in its place and i because we talked about wanting the truth the real truth behind his story and is it real or is it not how edward meets his wife is it, was it love at first sight? They saw each other across the circus stage and <laughs> they fell in love and now he's spending three years trying to find her and everything about her or or what? Because yeah. the way that the, it's portrayed in the story is he stalks her for three years, shows up at her university and says, I'm in love with you, will you marry me? And, and she even says, says, yeah, and she even throughout it says, I don't, I, you don't know me. And I don't yeah. know you. Yeah. And then, but all he then ever... she just accepts that. Oh, okay. I'm now going to break off my engagement to this guy. We're going to get married, just based on the the fact that you've been stalking me for three years, trying to find everything about me. Well, and that's a failure in the movie because they do discuss that the realities, and they're like, you know, Marion Cotillard's character says, you know, do you know how they? Have he's ever told you the story of how they met? And he's like, yeah, and it's all BS, like. They met at Auburn. That's it. Like they both attended college or she, while she was going there, he showed up and, and, you know, it's just like, it wasn't a big, like, but yeah. he doesn't go into any detail. Like he makes it seem as if he knows the true story, but doesn't tell the true story. It's just glossed over. And it's like, okay. I mean, that's one of the storylines that I don't really like because it is yeah. basic. Like until it gets to the fight and he's just like, Oh, and I got the crap kicked out of me. Cause she told me not to fight. And it's like, yeah, uh-huh. she told you not to fight. Not because this guy was bigger than you and could actually fight. Like, that's what it seems like. Is you got the crap kicked out of you. And then she left him because she realized that he was violent. And then, yeah. you know, that's where she felt empathy for him. And then, yeah, like, you know, there's a more much more interesting story there than either side has told. And, you know, the movie spends, you know, 10 minutes on it. And you're like, well, let's go back to fighting fish in the river or whatever it was <laughs> like yeah it just the the missing fact details of these stories it it's a struggle to just try and understand what is real and what isn't because you can always make the assumption of as what you just said well they met at college and they both went to college together and she was engaged to another guy, but then broke it off because a guy was violent or whatever. You can make those assumptions, but because there is no fact to it, you're just making assumptions. You both are like, I want to know the facts and the realities of it. And I'm like, I kind of do too. And I think it'd be more interesting to learn those kinds of things, but I'm okay with the embellishments. Like, Well, I think and I- that's kind of where I, 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 I like some of the embellishments, but 
I do fall in line with thinking of how the son feels because yeah. his whole life he's just been told what he believes to be lies or he's stuck trying to figure out what is fact and what isn't. And he does kind of just continue to tell the stories of his, like the legend of his dad. Cause you know, the final scene is him. They're having a barbecue at the pool and his, his son is telling the story of the giant and he was 15 feet tall. And everybody's like, no way. That's not true. And he's like, yeah, it is dad. Right. And he's like, yeah, that's the remember- way I remember it. It's like, yeah. So yeah, that's the story. It's yeah. I'm so. fine with, the way the stories were told, all the embellishments, that's fine, right? Like, I would be yeah. fine if none of that changed. And I'm not, I don't really care about knowing all of the facts necessarily, but it's the way this, it all ended where, yeah, the, the son just, just gave up and is like, Oh, okay. Yeah. They have this, we had this touching moment where I learned how to tell a story and make, crap up too so now mm-hmm. i love my dad and he's all the best dude ever and then he just like i'm gonna that's just how i'm gonna be because that's how my dad did it and like that complete shift like i don't buy it i don't buy it whatsoever yeah, I, and i hated how that ended that he, yeah. he just gave up like there was there was no conclusion but bet- with that relationship yeah. just oh we and have this touching yeah. moment he died, and now I tell stories. I guess, like I, yeah. I don't buy it. I don't like. I don't like the resolution to it. I yeah. wish that the resolution would have been more. Um, even have that still be the way that his father dies. That he does tell him that story about that. Yeah, I thought but that scene was before fine, that happens. But before that happens, have the opposite where his dad finally like instead of the doctor being the one to tell him that yeah. story that needed to be his dad telling him that story like mm-hmm. his dad needed to finally make give he needed that to reveal himself to like, as a real yeah. person and and I think introducing that like if if he were to kind of like lay lay all his cards out um in the story yeah. like it would change the dynamic of the film and maybe that's not where they wanted to go with it but yeah. I think it would have been a much better film. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's one of the things we talk about. I'm thinking through the whole specter scene and the, the metaphor we've talked a lot about having an ambiguous ending makes it can make for a good film, but having an ambiguous film is bad. And that's to me, that's more where that ambiguity comes in where you're like, what does it mean when he was walking through the woods and lost the key to the city of it? You know, but yeah. then he finds it years later. Like there's, there's meaning behind those, but you got to kind of fill it in a little bit more. Just, just like, make it up. That's what he did. Yeah. And just make it up. Like, yeah, things were, things were really bad and then they were good. You're like, okay, but how were they bad? What did you do? What happened to you? How did you, you know, how did you react to that? And I think Why do a lot I of it care? is just that. Yeah. And that's, that's, I think the ultimate part of that. We'll leave you guys there. Uh, let us know what you thought of big fish. If you have seen it, if you haven't seen it, go watch it. Uh, you can see it on IMDb TV. That's how I watched it. You just have to suffer through ads. Um, but I think it makes it available through Amazon prime. So, um, yeah, still through IMDb TV, but well, yeah, uh, you can also just like IMDb.com slash watch. Anyway, nice plug IMDb TV. Anyway, um, uh, like always, give us comments, um, ideas. We have been getting a lot of ideas on our gameplays, but I don't think we've really had movie ideas yet. Um, so I'd love to see that. Anyway, you guys are awesome. Have a good one. We'll see you in the next one. Adios. See ya.